do we speak the truth in love? Hot topics. That's the name of our series right now. Hot topics. We are living in a time when we have conflicting values among our friends, even among our family members, certainly in the world we live. We have conflicting values. Not, not only values that are different, they are in contradiction. They, they clash. So how do we speak the love, speak the truth in love? And it's because we love our neighbors, we need to, we want to, we get to speak the truth. And we have been dealing with topics like freedom, topics like identity, and this morning, we are handling, I believe, is the hottest topic in the series. It's on morality. Morality. So here's the question. How do you define? How do you define what is right and wrong? How do you, how do you define what is moral? And how do you know what is immoral? How do you go about having this conversation? It's a difficult one. It's a hot topic. Well, let me give you a few examples. The conflict that has been going on in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. People are suffering around the world because of what has happened. No one condoned what Hamas did. And at the same time, there has been rising objections as to the the. the the response of Israel, uh, Israel in the Gaza Strip. How do you know who's right and who's wrong? We have conflicting values and conflicting opinions. What about abortion? How do you navigate this conversation? One group says, at the end of the day, it is the right of the woman. The other group says, at the end of the day, it's the protection of the unborn. How do you go about speaking the truth in love? And who gets to decide who's right? How do you know? Can you tell? Are you sure? Now that I have your attention, let's give a couple more examples, shall we? Is gender binary or fluid? Hot topic of the day. Some of you are saying, oh, please don't go there. Please don't go there. But, but, but that's a fair question. Some people say gender is binary. Others say it's fluid. Who is right? That is to say, is one right and the other wrong? Or how do you define more importantly? I'm just giving you examples. The question is, how do you know what is moral, what is right, and what is immoral, what is wrong? I'm going to say this one last thing, and, and I'll move on. Transgender in sports. How do you navigate that conversation? There is a man born, there's a person born as a man, went through the transgender experience and, and all the, now the person is a she, and in this swimming event, she is winning all the competitions, beating all the competitions, and taking all the titles home. And, and people are saying, that is not right. And others are saying, oh, no, that's just fine. How do you talk about this? I'm going to say a prayer for my sake. <laughs> that be okay? Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of the heart be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. To your glory and to our edification. Amen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to help us to find ways to respond to the cultural narrative when it comes to morality. Now, I, one thing that I really appreciate about Mosaic House Church is the fact that we have lots of people on their spiritual journey, meaning we have people who are seeking, I stand corrected. We have people whom God is seeking, and that's why you are here. 
You aren't sure about Jesus Christ yet, but you are drawn to him, are you not? God is seeking you. We also have people who are brand new Christians, like infants, babies. I don't mean flora. I mean like fully grown people, but young faith. We also have people who've been walking on this journey with Jesus Christ for decades. We have all kinds of people. But so I am going to address this question to you all for this purpose, so that you in turn learn how to respond to the cultural narrative when it comes to morality. Okay? So uh, you will see the, uh, in front of you, there, there's a ser sermon outline QR code. Please use that. You can also uh, use your phone by pointing to the screen behind me. You can do that. And also, at the end of the message, after we sing a song, you get to submit questions to this number. And I am going to anticipate lots of questions today. So there is a number up on the screen behind me. So please you, you utilize that. Last comment. Um, do you know the difference between a topical sermon and an expository sermon? An expository sermon is something that we do at Mosaic House Church extensively about 50 sermons out of 52 sermons of the year, it's expository. An expository sermon is there is a text, a, a passage from the Bible. And the preacher, someone like me, I pray before the Lord, I study really hard, and I bring out what God wants to say out of that passage. Got it? That's expository sermon. Topical sermon is a bit different. The, there, there's a topic like, so how do we... Speak the truth in love. So I am going to go to not just one passage. I'm going to go to the whole Bible and, and draw from other places. Hence, it's a topical sermon. What is important is either expository or topical, the preacher has to preach from the Word. Got it? Okay, so here. Um, There are two mistakes. There are two mistakes Christians make dealing with the cultural narrative on morality. Okay? Two mistakes. So the culture says something is right or something is wrong. And most Christians either do one of they do one of two things. The first mistake is fear and silence which is, hey, I know what's right, and I disagree with, 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 with what the cultural narrative is saying, but I'm afraid. If I open my mouth and speak the truth in love, I may be labeled as a bigot, close-minded, and I want to be caring, I want to be sensitive, so, you know, I'm afraid, so I'm just going to remain silent. How many of you know, how many of you know someone like that? Okay, only one of you and the rest is lying. Okay. <laughs> the second mistake that people make is this. This is what I call superiority and judgmentalism. I know I'm right, you are wrong, and you are evil, and I'm better than you. They may be right. I may actually agree with their stance on certain morality issues. And yet, they are so mad, upset, and so proud, and they look down, up, down upon everybody else. How many of you, how many, do you know anyone like that? All of you, I see. Okay. How do you respond to that? I'll be gentle. 1 Peter chapter 3. To those of you who feel, I know the truth, but I'm afraid to speak it. And therefore, I'm going to remain silent. Okay? Here's what Lord Jesus says to you today. The first Peter was written by the Apostle Peter to a church in the modern-day Turkey. They were, they, were, they, were, they were being persecuted 
persecuted, persecuted for their faith in Jesus. We follow Jesus. Jesus is our God. He tells us, he defines what is morality. And because of that, they were being persecuted. And here's what the Lord says to the church. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Why are you blessed? Because do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. It's real. Fear is real. You are afraid. And the, the persecution is right in your face. It's happening every day. And the Lord says, do not fear. But instead, do this. Do what? In your hearts, revere Christ. Revere, worship Christ. Set apart Christ as Lord. And here's how you do that. How do I revere Christ in the face of persecution? Always be prepared. Not just sometimes. Always, always be prepared. This is your responsibility and something you could do, something you want to do, and something you, you get to do. Be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. When people ask you, how do you know? How do you know Jesus is right? Why do you stand on that side of the issue? You give them the reason for the hope that you have. Be prepared. But do this with gentleness and respect. Not out of hatred, not out of superiority, but out of gentleness and respect. Because you love them, you tell them the truth. Verse 16, keep, and, and I love this, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Show them love. Pray for them. Buy them lunch. Shovel the snow of their sidewalk. Love them. The focus is not being right. The focus is giving Jesus glory as your Lord and loving your neighbor, even those who disagree, even those who persecute you for what you believe to be true. Okay? What about the mistake of being feeling superior and being judgmental? How many of you heard, do not judge lest you be judged? And therefore, who are you to say that's a wrong thing to do? Who are you to judge their immoral act? Right? Okay, okay. This is one of the most misquoted Bible verses ever. Do not judge. Because God says, call the sinner out. Speak the truth. And you are making a moral judgment. So this, is here. So this, is, this is Jesus Christ speaking, Matthew 7. Here's what it means. Do not judge lest you be judged. You got to read the whole context. Chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. So therefore, don't say nothing. No, 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 no. Now, what, when I say don't say nothing, that's, that's for emphasis, right? It's bad grammar for emphasis. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you, Victor, look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, Victor. Then you will see clearly. Now the rain is gone. Now you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, the context of do not judge lest you be judged. Jesus is saying, examine yourself first. Remove the big log in your own eye, Victor. Only then you may say, may I identify this tiny little speck sawdust in yours? 
meaning be humble, be humble. See, he said this in the context of the Pharisees who felt superior over all the sinners because they thought by their obedience to God's moral law, they were feeling better, superior. And hence, they were being judgmental. So here's what I want to end with. Judge, Victor, but do not be judgmental. You get it? Okay. If I'm wrong, if I'm immoral, if I'm engaged in an immoral behavior or conduct, you got to call me out. you got to judge my behavior. That is wrong. But refrain from being judgmental, as in, and therefore, I condemn you. Therefore, I am better than you. Judge me without being judgmental. Yeah. So this... So let's, let's move on. Let's move on. So here's the cultural narrative on morality today. And you hear this all the time in the news, in the movies. You read about it in the books. This is everywhere, which is this. There are no moral absolutes. This is year 2023. Morality, therefore, is relative and subjective. Therefore, one should not impose his or her morality on others. You've, you've heard this before, right? Okay. You felt it before, right? Okay. So, so this, this is not the full, this does the job of describing what the cultural narrative is on the topic of morality. It's not absolute, and therefore it's relative. It may be right now, to these people, but it's not right for everyone at all times, and therefore it's subjective. What's right for me is true, and what's right for you is also true. There's no contradiction. It's subjective and relative, and therefore no one, I should not impose my morality on you. Okay, right? That's, that's a fair description of the cultural narrative on morality. I'm going to give the following responses. How should we respond to that when our friends, when our loved ones, when people that we love and care about say such things? Now, we've got to do this very gentle, with respect, dignity, and honor. Agreed? First, first response. The assertion that there are no moral absolutes is an absolute moral statement. Therefore, it's a contradiction. Okay, okay let, me, let me unpack it. Okay. When people say there are no absolute morality, meaning this is true in all situations, in all times, in for every people in the face of the earth. Okay? So no absolutes. Everything is relative. That statement is an absolute moral statement. There's nothing right or wrong that is absolute. So I just made a contradiction of my statement. Does that make sense? Okay. Think about it. Response two. Everyone, write that word, everyone is imposing his or her morality on others. Everyone. People who say there are no absolute, absolute morality, and people who say there are such, a, uh, such absolute moral values, everyone is imposing their views. When I say to you, morality is not subjective. It's objective, and it's true for all people, not for certain people, not people over there at that time. No, true for all people at all times. So I am saying, I'm, I'm imposing my view on you. That's the truth. When you say to me, that is not true, Victor, you should 
embrace my definition, my values, my moral understanding, which is there are no absolutes. What are you doing? You are imposing your value on me. I'm not being mean about it. I'm just saying, let's call the spade a spade. Okay? So let, let us not have this nonsense where, oh, only Victor is imposing his view because he claims to have moral absolutes. No, everyone is imposing his or her own views on everyone. Okay? Response three. This is a really important. We cannot call anything moral or immoral unless there is a higher law against which it can be measured. Let me repeat that. We cannot, we, we are not able, there's no way any, a, anybody can say something is moral or immoral unless there's a higher law, higher standard, higher morality against which it can be measured. I'm going to read a quote from Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. This, this is a really, really famous letter. It's called The Letter from a Birmingham Jail. He was, as you know, was a civil rights activist back in the 50s and the 60s. And he was protesting in the streets peacefully that the law of the land at the time in the USA was immoral and for which he was arrested and confined to jail. And here is what he wrote in this letter. Quote, A law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. The only way he was able to say the laws of the USA which are racist, the only way he could have said that was if he knew that there was a higher law than the law of the land, which is the moral law or, or the, the, the code given to us by God himself. There has to be a higher law. So, so here, here. Let's suppose there is no higher code of morality because there is no God. So all we have is my morality and your morality. And we differ. At the end of the day, who's right? Who's right? Nobody and everybody. Right? There has to be a higher law let me try this. I believe Koreans are the superior race in human history. <laughs> I just made a racial statement. Ethnocentric statement. Koreans are the best. We rule. Now, what do you say to that? No, you are wrong. You ain't the best. But that doesn't matter. You should not have said that. I say, why not? Why, why can't I make such a statement? And your response is, because that's racist. I, I said, okay, so what? So I'm a racist. Okay, have a nice day. When you say that is wrong, then you have a higher standard by which you can judge me. If there is no higher standard, at the end of the day, you say what you say, I say what I say. And, and that's what Martin Luther King is getting at. The, the racial unjust laws are unjust and immoral because there's a higher code, higher law, which says that is wrong. Response well, here, look. Fyodor Dostoevsky, he wrote so famously, if there's no God, if there's no God, everything is permitted. If there's no higher morality, 
then at the end of the day, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. There is no right or wrong. Response four, only God can must, only God can and must define for you what is right and what is wrong. Therefore, only God can do it and he must do it. And if he doesn't do it, then we are, we are left to our own. I'm right. You're right. No one's right. Everyone's right. Let me read Exodus chapter 20. The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. I, God, spoke all these. And, sorry, and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Why is that moral? Why is that right? Because God says so. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Do not worship anything other than God. Why is that right? Why is that moral? Because God says so. Verse 4, 7. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Why is this right? Why is this moral? And it, it, why? Because God says so. Yeah? Um, funny story. This past week at our house church, we were sharing our conversations, and so this, this person works in an environment where there's, there's, there's just profanity everywhere all day long, okay? And so when, when he hears someone saying, Jesus Christ, he says, hallelujah. <laughs> and then someone, someone says, oh yeah? When I hear someone saying, Jesus Christ, I say, Where? Continue, continue. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. Work, but do not work on the Sabbath on the seventh day. Call it holy, keep it holy, come and worship God, and do not put yourself in the place of God by working seven days a week. Why is this right and moral? Because God says so. Mom and dad, you will love this. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land, in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Why is this right? Because God says so. Let me continue. You shall not murder. And if you murder someone, it is immoral, it is wrong because God says so. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Why is this right? Because God says so. Now, however, you may not be satisfied by this statement because God says so. Okay? okay, I get it. He's the lawgiver. He sounds like a tyrant. So this is right, and therefore do it. Oh, okay. When I was seven years old, in my living room, in the house that my parents owned, in which they graciously allowed me to live, <laughs> there's a stove right in the middle of the living room. Okay? Yontambul. And my mom said, son, don't touch the stove. <laughs> Why not, mama? She said, because I said so. Right? Fair. Fair. And guess what Victor did? Touched it. He touched the stove. <laughs> big old blister right at the end of my index finger, like big as this, like, oh. Okay, so... Mom was right. Don't touch it. 
She even explained why I shouldn't touch it. But I didn't listen to her. So God says, do obey these moral laws. Why? Because I said so. Well, can you give an explanation? You got it? Here. Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Why is it, why is it immoral that I lie to my neighbor? When I lie to my neighbor, God says, it is wrong, Victor. Why? Because God says so. But what's the explanation? The neighbor is made in the image of God. Everyone that you lock eyes with has infinite value and dignity. Whether 95-year-old Alzheimer grandpa, whether one-month-old infant, everyone has value because they are made in the image of God. Here, look. Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood by humans Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. Why? For in the image of God has God made mankind. Okay? So all the moral laws of heaven, what is right and what is wrong, right, what, what is right and wrong, it's because, because in our interactions with our, another human being who is made in, in the image of God, you better treat them with value and dignity and respect and love. That's why lying is immoral. And God says so. Response five. God has written his moral laws in everyone's heart. We don't need a Bible to know what is right and wrong. It is in our hearts. God, etch them in your souls already. Here, look, Romans chapter 2. Be blown away by the truth of God's word. Indeed, when Gentiles, who don't have the Ten Commandments, or the Old Testament Bible, okay? Indeed, when Gentiles, who do not have the law, they do by nature things required by the law. Huh, they do. They don't have the Bible. They know nothing about the Ten Commandments, but they know them. Because they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Why is that? Verse 15. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witness. And their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. Friends, here's what Jesus is saying. He has written in everyone's heart regardless of whether you are an atheist, agnostic, Believer, Koreans, Dutch, every human being has God's law written in his or her heart. It's called conscience. Everyone knows murdering, murder, is immoral. Everyone. How is that possible? Because God has written it in everyone's heart. I got to land the plane. Respond six. Respond six. God's laws are given to us for His glory and our freedom. God's laws, the morality, has been given to us for His glory and for our freedom. Okay? Let me bring it to Jesus. This is John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the word, Word, is referring to Jesus Christ. Okay? So when I see, read the word, Word, you say Jesus. Let's try that word. Jesus. You guys are the best. <laughs> Second and third. 
in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. You were created by Jesus. He's the Creator God. And without Jesus, nothing was made that has been made. In Jesus was life. And the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus, the Creator, He brings light. That light shines all darkness. He opens our eyes. And because He opens our eyes, because we see the light, we know what is right and wrong. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize Jesus. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who believed, but to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human dis decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Would you read the last verse with me? The Word. Jesus. Oh, I'm impressed. The Word, Jesus, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer, the one who's coming back. He gave us the moral laws to God's glory and to our freedom. Nicky Gumbel was a vicar uh, pastor in the Anglican Church in England. Okay? When his son was about seven years old, he took his son to a soccer game. So a bunch of seven-year-olds playing soccer. He got there, no coach. Coach Andrew never showed. And all these moms said, Nikki, you're the only dad here. You be the ref. You be the ump. He said, I don't know how to play soccer. I don't know the rules. I don't know the laws. No, 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 no. This is the way. So Nikki said, okay, boys, play on. And they began playing. And one boy tackled another boy, and someone shouts, Saw! Foul! Somebody says, No, sir, legit. Nikki said, I didn't know. Play on. A few minutes later, the ball goes out of bounds. Someone says, Sir, the ball is out of bounds. Another said, No, sir, it's inbound. Nikki said, I didn't know. Play on. And it was chaos, he said, like boys falling down and getting hurt and moms all, all upset. They're having a horrible day. And then the coach, Andrew, showed up. He was held by traffic. He put down the pie lines. He defined the boundaries and the lines and he had a whistle. He said, play on. And they played. And he blew the whistle. Boop! That's a foul. The ball goes around, he blew the whistle, out of bounds. He enforced the law. And at the end of the day, the boys had a wonderful time. Were the boys freer without the law and the rules? Or were they freer with the rules? With. We are made, created by Jesus Christ, the Lord. And he gave us rules, morality, what's right and wrong, Ten Commandments, the laws of the Bible. When you remain here, you will be so free. And when you go outside of the boundary, you will not be free. You'll be enslaved. Stay here. Victor, don't touch the stove. Live within the boundaries, the bounds of morality. And that's because God loves us. And we want to love Him. And when we love Him, we get to love our neighbors. 
with the same love. So in conclusion, do it with gentleness and respect. So quick, crawl, walk, and run. Those of you who are ready to crawl, you be prepared to speak the truth of Jesus Christ. Be prepared. He's not, he's not asking, would you like to be prepared when people ask you the reason for the hope that you have in Christ? No, be prepared, command, imperative, do it. Walk. Speak the truth, but do so in love. With humility, dignity, and utter respect. And run. Vote, everyone. Vote. Vote. The morality of the land is defined by your votes. Pray with me. And you will see the number to which you may submit your questions. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the lawgiver, you are not a tyrant, but you are the Lord. You define what is right for us. And as we obey, there is freedom, there is joy. We were meant to live in your freedom. This has been a tough topic, and yet I believe I spoke the truth in love. And if I didn't, oh Lord, by your mercy, by your grace, remove it from the hearers, from, from the ears of the hearers. I want to end by saying, oh Lord, Friends, no matter where you are at on your spiritual journey, you need Jesus as I do. He calls you to himself each day, every day. So, Father, I pray we come near to you. We come near to you by your grace. And may we become an agent of your grace and love in our community, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. Sisters and brothers in Christ and all the seekers who are on this journey, may the Lord bless you. May the good Lord turn his face towards you. May the good, good Lord cause his countenance to shine upon you and give you peace, truth, and love for forever and ever. And God's people said, amen. amen.